Thank you very much. Uh, it's very bright up here, in case uh, you, you didn't uh, pick that up right away. I'm, uh, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, I have, this is my first DDD conference of any sort. I was reflecting on my, uh, I, I, sort of my world and the DDD world sort of bump into each other, but, uh, but don't really overlap a whole lot. And I was thinking about when I first heard about DDD, um, I had actually worked with Eric uh, in 2000, um, and I'm not going to ask who here was born in 2000, because it'd be too depressing. Um, and we, we worked on a project that also included some other uh, notables. This was the, the whole dot-com era when we were all going to get rich. Didn't, didn't happen. Um, and uh, it was an interesting domain. It, the domain was uh, planning for retail purchasing, which it's one of those things where you say, how many times have I said this as a programmer, how complicated can that be? <laughs> and the answer is always, is really complicated. But he, he, uh, the team, and, and Eric included, really dug into what it meant to do a better job of retail purchasing. And then the dot-com crash happened and everybody scattered to the winds. But that was the first introduction that I had to it. And then when the book came out, I read it and thought, hmm, interesting ideas. It's a little different than my approach to it, but I'll be informed by this in the future. But I've never been a follower or an applier of DDD, like straight out of the book. So it was interesting to get, for me, to get this invitation and have a chance to come and see what had happened to the community and the community of practice uh, over, uh, over the past 20 years. Um, XP, Extreme Programming, uh, has its own community of practice. It's also grown and adapted. Um, I had a conversation with Eric uh, a couple of days ago about our different approaches to our community. So he has stayed very involved. I've kind of pulled back and done other things. And uh, so it's not often you get a chance to talk to somebody in, in, a, in that similar kind of situation, having started something, having seen a big community grow, and well, how do you manage that as, uh, as somebody who likes to start stuff and isn't so good at finishing things? That would be me. So um, when I got the invitation to come and speak, I thought, what in the world am I going to, uh, to talk to you folks about? I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a title that's so generic that I could fit absolutely anything into it. <laughs> and then I'll just go talk to people. And I'll see what it is I think I need to say, given the people that I've talked to. And so that's what I'll be doing. Um, I don't, I hand, you'll see in a second, I hand draw my slides. I don't have prepared slides. So... I have an opportunity to kind of come up with things in the moment, which I really appreciate. And uh, I hope that you will too. And, and if you don't, you'll probably tell me about it. So that's okay. So <clears throat> first thing I wanted to share was, uh, is not about programming at all. It's about uh, public speaking. Somebody asked me in the elevator this morning, uh, are you getting nervous about giving your keynote? And I said, well, I wasn't until you asked me. <laughs> so, no, that's not what I said. It's not true. But it would be a really good response. <laughs> so, no, what I said was, uh, um, no, not really. But there's actually more to the story. There's a, a reason that I don't get nervous when I speak. When I was in college, the American school system is weird, like everything American. But one of the things about it is you don't get stuck in a track. I think there are, are educational systems where very early you decide what you're going to study and that's the one thing that you study and you, you stay focused on it. In America, it's a little loosey-goosey. So my first year, I was a computer science student. The second year, I was a music student, because of course. And then I missed programming, so then I was a computer science student. And then I was a music student, and I did my senior recital. Then I did my master's in computer science. And I just ended on the wrong year, 
So here I am speaking at a computer conference. Okay. So one of the things about music, though, is you have to deal with performance anxiety. Everybody feels some anxiety around performance. And uh, there's a beautiful book called The Soprano on Her Head about dealing with performance anxiety. And the, the story from the title is a, there was a soprano, had a beautiful voice, had so much anxiety she just couldn't sing anymore. So the teacher had her stand on her head and sing. And it was just beautiful again. Like all of the anxiety went away. Of course, she couldn't do that on stage because that would really look weird. But it was, it was, it's like a, an example. Like, no, you, you can still sing. That's the, as a musician, you're like, well, maybe my fingers won't work this time or something like that. And they usually do, so that's okay. But there was an exercise in that book. And it went like this. It said, imagine yourself going up on stage and performing. Now, take an inventory of your physical sensations at that moment. Your stomach's queasy, your palms are sweaty, your breathing is up in your chest and shallow. Okay, so that's what, that's what nervousness feels like, right? Now imagine yourself Christmas morning as a kid. You're about to go in and open the presents. Just imagine that moment and take an inventory of your physical sensations at that moment. Your palms are sweaty, your stomach's a little queasy, your breathing's shallow and high up in your chest, and you're excited. So the same sensations, you say, well, I'm feeling nervous. That tag of nervousness applied to those sensations is a choice that you make. And you could say, I'm excited at that moment. Now then I remembered uh, the first time we ever, uh, Ward Cunningham and I ever presented about patterns. 1987, we're in a workshop. Um, we had done our first experiments with patterns. Things had gone exceedingly well. We had a little write-up, and I was going to get up and present. And around the table were all the heavy hitters of the day. Grady Booch was there. A very young Jeanette Wing was there. Adele Goldberg. And I was just getting nervous as I'll get out. My, my time slot was in the afternoon, of course. So I had all day to... Uh, and I remember about mid-morning, I was just getting exhausted because I was, I, I was feeling so, so nervous. And then I remembered this book. And I said to myself, I am really excited. And the, the negative experience of all of those physical sensations just went away. I, I, it, and it was just a change of my frame. So... In answer to the uh, elevator question, are you nervous? No, I'm excited. I feel some of the same sensations as when I feel nervous, but I just choose to frame them as, wow, I've got something to talk to you about that I really want to talk to you about. So, Now, if you don't care at all about the technical content, I've just given you something that you can take away and use regardless of, of what else it is that you do. You're welcome. <laughs> OK, on to the geeky stuff. So here's what I noticed most about the conversations that I've had over the last couple of days. There are a lot of people talking about coupling and cohesion. Yeah? Important concepts really the foundation of the work we do as software designers. But the other thing I noticed is everybody means something a little bit different when they say coupling and cohesion. Sometimes it's a big concept, sometimes it's a small concept. It goes in slightly different directions. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, I was on a panel celebrating the 30th anniversary of the publication of Structured Design, the Green Book. How many people have read Structured Design? OK, cool. The rest of you are in, are in for a treat. This is a book that uh, Ed Jordan, 
uh, of blessed memory, and Larry Constantine had written, describing their experience with a whole range of software written in the early days of programming. They, what they did was they looked at the software and they said, uh, of the programs that were hard to change, what features do they have in common? And of the programs that were easy to change, what features did they have in common? Can we see any patterns in how the software is constructed? And the answer was yes. And they came up with these concepts, coupling and cohesion, to, to describe the common properties of programs that are cheap to change. Now, back in the early, early days, the th thought was that we would build programs and then just run them. Like uh, manufacturing, you build a car, yeah, maybe there's a little bit of maintenance, but you don't like rebuild the car. Now, it turned out the software wasn't like that. We fought against that for a long time. You know, people would say, I remember the breathless, we spend 70% of our development budget on maintenance. Isn't that awful? Doesn't that show what a horrible job we're doing? And that's true if you had a car and you spent 70%. 30% buying the car and 70% maintaining it, it would not be a very good car. But the thing about software is the very uh, presence of the software, as soon as the software comes into being, the needs that it addresses change. So by its very nature, software changes itself. You know, you People see some feature and they say, oh, I'd like this other feature too. They would never have thought of that until they'd seen that first feature. That was a big surprise. So these concepts of coupling and cohesion were laid out very precisely in the green book, the structured design book. Now, I had had structured design as a textbook when I was in college. And so when I went to sit on this panel, I re realized that I should actually read the Green Book for the first time, because you know it was a college text. It's not like I read it. <laughs> so I read it, and I was just, I was so excited. I mean, there's some weird stuff in there, like a very thoughtful discussion about assembly language versus higher level languages, you know, which was an open question at that time. And, and something about punched cards and paper tape, and I'm like, woof. So that part aged quickly. But the part that didn't age at all was, were these concepts of coupling and cohesion. And the definitions are very precise in that book. Since then, we've come up with other uses for those words. So what I'd like to do is go back to those original definitions and say, here's a meaning, here's a concept of coupling in this very particular way I'm talking about it, and, and you can apply whatever word you want to, to, to it, but that concept is really valuable and important. So we should separate that, I think, this is the message I bring to you, separate that concept from other concepts that we may also apply the word coupling to we should probably find other words for those things because this thing I'm talking about is very important and worth focusing on as a designer. So, uh, first, software is built out of elements. And when I say element, I mean things at all different scales. So, Variables are elements, and statements are elements, and expressions are elements, and functions, and classes, and modules, and services. All these things are elements. Repositories are elements. Um, so when I say I have two elements, A and B, and I say that they're coupled, what does that mean? So it means that if I change A, I also have to change B. So here's the, in, a, in something that looks a little more like a, a, a mathematical notation, A and B are coupled with respect to a particular change. So coupling is always with respect to a particular change. If changing A 
implies changing B. That's the original definition of coupling. So if, if I have two services and one service calls the other, th those services are not coupled by this definition. They have some relationship. And we should have a word for that relationship, but it's not coupling. Unless changing one service means that we have to change the other service too in order for the system to stay in, in, a, in a working state. So an example that came up yesterday in conversation was here I have a service. It takes in some, uh, some parameters and there's a parameter A and a parameter B and I want to change the name of B to C. But I p pass this to another service that expects parameters A and B and connects it. I think the number it was quoted to me was seven. This thing is passed s through seven layers of services, all of which expect the names to be sorry, A and B. So these services are coupled with respect to name changes of the parameters. I can, I can go inside of a service, I can go inside this service and make all the changes I want. As long as I don't change the name of the parameters, neither of the other services have to change. So uh, for those kind of changes, the services aren't coupled, but for purposes of, of these names, they are coupled. And the complaint was, wow, if I have to change one, then I have to change all of them, and my best bet is then I have to deploy all the services at exactly the same time and make sure there aren't any requests in flight. So, like, it, and you, you have a distributed monolith, which is worse than a monolith. Um, so, how would you, how would you uh, go about making this kind of change? So, in my kind of design world, I use a pattern called a parallel where you have, briefly, you have two implementations of the same thing. So if I want to change B to C, I'm going to add a C here and make sure that it always contains the same value as B. Now I can deploy this. Nobody else is looking for C, so they don't care. Then I can add C here. And now I can start using C because I know it has exactly the same thing as B. And as soon as I'm done with that, as soon as I know that this service doesn't use B anymore to read it, I can stop passing it. Then I can make this change too. So I don't actually have to deploy all of these changes at exactly the same time. By going through a little bit of this uh, making things worse and then making them better, I have a chance to uh, decouple the ch changes. I can stage the, the changes. So that's a trick that always seems to bother a lot of people because it makes things worse. I have duplication. I have more duplication, and then it makes things better. But there is another life lesson for you. Rule number one is things always get worse before they get better. And rule number two is you can do, you can do it. That's a... Uh, so, I thought this was going to be a programming talk with some little life lessons, and it may be the other way around by the time we're done. But we got a half an hour, so let's see what happens. Okay, so that's coupling. Coupling means I have these two elements. If I change this one, I have to change that one too. Uh, why is that important? It's important because uh, cost. The cost of software is roughly equivalent to the cost of change. That's that observation about we spend most of the money in software development on maintenance, which is just, in the XP world, we took this entirely all the way and said, instead of spending 70% on maintenance, what if we spent 99% on maintenance? That seems like a good number. We'll just get it in production and then build it up from there. 
and then we're mostly making changes. But the cost of change, all changes don't cost the same amount. The cost of change is approximately equal, and I'll explain why in just a second, to the cost of big changes. Now, what do I mean by big changes? Um, if you made a histogram of the cost of changes, this is the count of the number of changes that you make, and uh, this is the cost. That's supposed to be a euro sign. This is the minus of handwriting slides. This is my, um, my drawing handwriting sucks, so. Oh, well. So if we make a histogram, what it's going to look like is this. We're going to have lots and lots of little changes that are cheap, and we're going to have a few changes that are really expensive. What are those? What's the nature of those changes? And here's where coupling, as defined just here, is really helpful. What makes changes really expensive is not just the change. It's I change this, so I have to change those, so I have to change those, so I have to change those. It's this cascading effect. Now, if you've looked at complexity theory, you're going to recognize a power law distribution here. And it's the exact same mechanism as causes avalanches and hurricanes. You know, most avalanches is, is just one snowflake falls over. And that's it, and nothing else happens. But there's a non-zero chance that one snowflake falling over is going to cause two more snowflakes to fall over. And each of those has a non-zero chance of causing two more and more and more. So if you make a histogram of the size of avalanches, most of them are just going to be one snowflake falling over, and that's that. And there's a bajillion of those happening all the time, and you don't really notice, but you notice the one that comes sweeping through the village and wipes everything off the map. And those happen every once in a while. The more changes, the more extreme both of the ends of this are going to be. So when we have way more changes, we're going to have many, many more small changes. And the most expensive change is going to be much, much more expensive. In software, what conducts the cost of, of a change is exactly coupling. If A and B are coupled, then when I change A, I have to change B. And if B is coupled to C and D, then I'm going to have to change C and D and, 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 and. thing about power law distributions is a big percentage of the cost is in this tail. Even though this is a small number of changes in an absolute number, the cost of that compared to the cost of all the rest of it, that tail is really expensive. So coupling is important. Because the less coupled your system is, the less likely the changes are to propagate, the less extreme the cost of these most expensive changes is, the longer you can last uh, continuing to change the software. So that's where that definition of coupling gets us. It's important because decoupling things reduces the cost of making changes over time. A coupling can be, uh, can be quite subtle. Uh, I was at Facebook for seven years. If you feel the need to blame me for like the destruction of democracy, go right ahead. Um, whoops. <laughs> I remember once there were two services. Now, you might think, well, coupling, that's like if this function calls that function and they're coupled with respect to the parameters, to the functions, that, OK, that's fine. But if I have two services that have nothing in common, then they're not coupled, right? Well, no. There's a non-zero chance that any change you make is going to break something somewhere else. 
And the more complicated the system, the more likely that you're going to have these crazy action at a distance effects. So there were two services. They happened to be deployed on the same physical rack. So each uh, computer has its own network interface card. They all flow up to a switch on the top, a network switch on the top of the rack. So one of the services changed its backup procedures to do all the backups at once, once a week. And that saturated that switch, that rack switch. The other service suddenly couldn't communicate to the rest of the world, and it failed. But so these two services are coupled with respect to changes to the backup procedures. Who knew, right? Everything can be coupled to everything else. And the bigger and more complicated the system, the more likely you are to find these kind of weird action at a distance couplings. And then what do you do? So as a designer, there are some principles that you can use that help to reduce that kind of coupling. Uh, the principles at the very finest grain, at the level of code, are the sorts of things that I wrote about in the Smalltalk best practice patterns, and then the Java version of that, the implementation patterns book, which is just, here's some habits that expert programmers use so that they communicate to other programmers. The most expensive coupling isn't the coupling that you, that you actually see, it's the couplings that you don't see, where like this, these two services sharing a rack switch. It's coupling nobody even knew existed until there was a disaster. So expert programmers just have some habits at the, at the lowest layer, like not using global state is a really simple one. Just be explicit about the data that goes in and data that comes out. And if you're explicit about the as my father would call them, the gazintas and the gazautas, then if you want to analyze the situation, you can see, OK, here's what goes in, here's what comes out. I'm not making any changes to global state. That's just a habit. If you can follow that habit, it'll be easier for you to identify coupling. So <clears throat> so the, there's a. There's an inverse of coupling through this other word, cohesion, that people talk about. Yeah? And it's another word that has, in the original definition, has a very precise definition, but that's not a definition that seems to have carried out over time. So here's the original definition of cohesion. If here I have an element, and it has sub-elements, this element, E, is cohesive to the degree that its sub-elements are coupled. That means is, if I have to change one of these, I'm going to have to change all the others at the same time. That makes E cohesive. Now, I, I read this in the green book. Well, isn't that bad to have all of your sub-elements coupled to each other? And as always, the answer is compared to what? If, uh, let's say we have a, a, another situation. I think of these things in kind of an abstract way. Let's say I have these two elements are coupled, but these others, other two aren't. And I need to go make a change to E, so I, so I make a change to this element, so I make a change to that element. But I'm going to have to at least look at these others. Let's say this is four functions in a file. And I, if I change one, if I change the writer, I have to change the reader too. And then there's some other functions, and I don't have to touch those. Now I might say, oh, well, that's good that I only have to look at part of this file in order to make the changes. But there's an even better solution which is to have this element be broken into two, where these things are coupled, 
with respect to the change, and I don't have to even think about this part. Now this, uh, you know, what, e, e sub one? This is more cohesive than E was originally, because if I change one of these, I'm always gonna have to change the other. And here's the beauty of cohesion. Like, eliminating coupling is hard. Always, you have this trade-off. Do you know this, the international symbol for trade-offs? Yes, yeah, some places if you walk around and you go, ah, other people will flash that sign back to you. And it's, it's what geeks do instead of being cool. Come on. <laughs> so there is always a trade-off between the cost of coupling. The cost of coupling is this, these rippling changes. So you've got that cost, and if you have a lot of coupling, then the cost of rippling changes is really high. And if you have hardly any coupling at all, then the cost of rippling changes is low. But you also have the cost of decoupling. And there'll always be some coupling in your systems. Uh, if you think there isn't any coupling today, tomorrow somebody's gonna ask for some change to the system that will reveal, oh, we do have coupling here after all. So you're always, as a designer, you're always balanced, I was gonna say precariously balanced, but it's not really precarious, it's just like this is what we do. You're always balanced between the costs of the coupling that you're experiencing because of the changes you're having to make and the cost of decoupling. And this is, these, this, is this moment where you say, I'm writing a book right now called Tidy First Question Mark. Because all developers all the time have this experience multiple times a day this code is ugly, but I have to change it. Should I tidy first? And that is exactly this moment of software design where you're saying, okay, there's, there's some kind of, I can either reduce coupling or improve cohesion, um, but do I do that or do I just make the change to the ugly code? And it's a legit trade-off. You can do the one, you can do the other. <clears throat> and you have to, that, I mean, that's why you get paid as a designer. You, you have to make this call about what you're going to do. What you're going to do. So here's the beauty about co of cohesion. C coupling is an n squared problem. You have n elements. They could all be coupled to all the other n elements in your system. And that n gets to be really large if you're talking about Facebook scale. Or even my current employer, Gusto, where we do small business payroll and benefits in the US. Turns out there's lots of small businesses. Also turns out that tax authorities and benefits providers have no incentive to make things simple. So they're there just spewing complexity and the beauty of, of what we do at Gusto is we take that complexity and we give the employer and their employees a simpler view of what it means to get paid. We make sure that forms get filed on time and all that. But in order to digest all that complexity is really, really hard. And no matter how good you make the code, some joker in uh, the Oregon Workers' Compensation Tax Authority is going to send you a new set of... of uh, specifications for the new regulations for if you have more than five employees, which you think would be simple to calculate, but it's not, then you have to deduct this percentage, which you would think would be simple, but it's not. And then six months later, they say, oh, wait, sorry, we realized that what we sent you was impossible to implement, so here's the new regulations. And here's how you're going to retroactively apply them to all of the forms that you already... Oh, my Lord. All of our data fits on a thumb drive. All of our customer data you know, you carry around in my pocket. The complexity is all in this incredibly complicated, rich domain. And number two, we can't screw up. At Facebook, I worked on Facebook Messenger for quite a while. And you always had some uh, slack, you know, just like, no, this isn't going to work. Ah, that's fine. The little button that says, uh, I was unable to send. Try again. You know, that was always an option. We don't have that option at Gusto. It's not like uh, I was unable to make things right with the IRS for you. 
Try again. <laughs> Does not work that way. Um, so what we do really matters. And, and if we screw up badly enough, we literally can go to jail. I mean, we can go to jail, not our clients. So um, uh, we have this big domain. We have a bunch of code to support it, which has grown organically. People use organic as some kind of pejorative, some kind of a, oh, this system just grew organically. What is your other option? <laughs> I mean, we're all carbon-based life forms, right? So I don't get it. Anyway, what was, what was I talking about? I'm going to get, I have four topics to discuss, and I'm going to get through one of them today. So... Um, coupling and cohesion. I think I'm almost there. Here's the thing about cohesion, though. Coupling is this n squared problem, and you think about n at a place like Facebook or n at a place like Gusto, the number of repositories and services and functions and variables and database tables and, 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 is very, very large. That n is big. And then every, a change to every single one of them could break every single other one of them in some way that is going to really surprise you at 3 a.m. So that's an intractable problem. As a designer, you don't get to work from a clean sheet of paper. You, you walk in and you've got a system and it's already running and you need to make it better in some kind of way. How do you reduce coupling? You remember that cost of decoupling over here? That's really, really enormous. So it can be challenging. It can be nearly impossible as a designer to identify what you even want to decouple. But here's the good news. You can always find things to make more cohesive. Seeing things that are cohesive that is, that are going to change at the same time and putting them in their own element, that's something you can do just analyzing locally. You don't have to know about all of everything. I realized uh, this as a habit when I watched one of my students refactoring. He needed to change two lines of code in the middle of a, a big function. And he... The first thing he did, just as a reflex, didn't even think about it. He extracted those two lines into their own helper function. He changed the two lines. He made sure that the tests passed. And then he inlined the, that little helper function back into the original. I thought, wow, that's a, that's a waste. That's like you could have just edited those two lines in the middle of the function. But instead, he created a cohesive element this function that would have to, the whole thing would have to be replaced. If any of the statements in it changed, all of the statements in it had to change. And then that was a much easier task. What are the, what's the state that I have to worry about while I'm in these two lines? And I don't have to think about all the stuff that came before, all the stuff that comes after. All I have to think about is what goes into this and what needs to come out. And that's easier. That's a cohesive element. Edit it, boom, and then, and then you can inline it again or not, your choice. But that moment of, now there's not a good verb for this, so I've invented cohesivating, <laughs> which somebody's going to come up with a better option than that. It's, is it, maybe this is a, an application of Cunningham's Law. You know Cunningham's Law? If you want a good answer to a question... On the internet, you don't post the question, you post a bad answer. And somebody will correct you. Most often a guy, but it's, that's a whole different set of political problems. Okay. Um, no, it's a guy if you don't want the answer changed. That's the, um, so you, you can always make things that are cohesive. Uh, and it turns out there's two styles of designers, lumpers and splitters. You know about this? I am definitely a splitter. I like lots of little pieces that are interacting with each other in fairly simple, straightforward ways. Um, other people want to have big, giant functions and big, giant 
tables and big giant uh, uh, objects so that they can see everything all at one glance. And I think this is a legit difference in thinking styles. Um, this is one where I'm not going to say my way is just strictly speaking better. Um, uh, so in this, in this uh, goal of reducing coupling over time, if you can't get rid of it, putting all the, as we would say on the farm, manure in one pile is better than having it spread all over the place. That is this moment of creating cohesion, where you're saying, well, we have all this code scattered all over the place that does, I don't know, authorization. Let's put it all in one place. And it won't be any easier to change in that one place, except that at least we know where to go to look. So that's this moment of creating cohesion, which tends to reduce coupling. You can't always know that you're doing it, but at least it gives you a, a path forward. So there's the original definitions of coupling and cohesion. Coupling is, if I change this, I have to change that with respect to a particular change. And cohesion says, if I change one of these things, then all of my siblings have to change too, which is a way of reducing the scope of coupling. <clears throat> Now, I am the sort of person who generates lots of ideas. And I've been thinking out about a bunch of stuff lately, um, some of which ties together and some of which I'm not going to be able to even come up with a plausible story for how it goes together. But here's, a, here's an observation that I made the other day um, writing this tidy first book. So there's a loop that goes, somebody has an idea for how the behavior of a system needs to change, and they change the behavior, and that gives them more ideas for how to change the behavior of the system. And so this is, your user sees your systems like this. They behave like this yesterday, it behaves like this today. We're hoping that that's a happy change. Sometimes it is. But as a developer or a designer, you know that there's another loop that's going on underneath the surface. You know the story about the swan? Right? The swan up above, it's all beautiful and majestic and it just glides smoothly along. And if you look under the water, there's these feet that are paddling and poop coming out. <laughs> so software development is like the swan. Except the graceful and beautiful above the surface part. <laughs> so the, thank you very much. So the other thing that's going on is you, you can't just change the behavior. You also have to change the structure of the system too. And how the system is structured affects, profoundly affects whether or not you can make the behavior changes that you want. Because of coupling, exactly because of coupling. You say, well, I could add this database, but then I'd have to go change these 20 places. So I'm going to take all those 20 places and I'm going to put them in one object. And now it's easy for me to change the database. That's a kind of structural change that you can do before you make a behavior change. And that's exactly this tidy first moment that I'm writing about, where you say, OK, Yes, I want the behavior of the system to change like this, but first I'm going to change the structure. Um, I came up with a slogan. Uh, let's see. I just I shortened it this morning over breakfast. Make change easy, then make easy change. There you go. That's your next T-shirt idea. <laughs> um, and this is... As programmers, we can be pretty masochi uh, yeah, masochistic sometimes. Like the pain of programming is a badge of honor. Where, oh, this is going to be really hard. It might not work at all. And we think that's a good moment. Like, oh, good. I get to now use my wizard-like powers as a programmer. Well, maybe that's a moment that we're really screwing up. Maybe that's a moment where we say, well, making this change would really be really hard. What would the system have to look like 
in order for this change to be easy. I want to make the change easy, then make the easy change. Well, then you're just, well, actually making the change easy can be hard too. So you have to reply it recursively because I am a computer scientist. I did take those three years in college of computer science where it's kind of like a zipper. You say, well, if the system was like this, then this change would be easy. But to get the system like this is going to be hard. But if the system was like this, then making that change would be easy. And if the system zip, 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 blah, 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 and then you can make the easy change. But that means that you're spending your brain power on making the next change easy, not on making the next change. And that can be, a, that's a hard moment. Uh, like the, the people observing these behavior changes, this is an artist's rendition of an eyeball, very interested eyeball. Whoops. What? Go. Oh, Jesus. Now what? If anybody, no connection, tap, does anybody have any idea how to get rid of this? Swipe to the right. Yeah, this thing here that isn't moving. All right, all right. What is the collective salary of this room right now? <laughs> I don't even. I, I, all right. No, not last pass. <laughs> the fuck? All right. There. <laughs> Can't even my, operate my own damn computer. Well, it's not really my computer. Apple keeps doing things to it. Um, <laughs> where was I? Oof. So from, from the, uh, the outside observer who just wants the new report to be printed or the new interactive video thing to pop up when you don't want it, uh, that's where all the pressure is. I want to see the change of the behavior. But... As professionals, we understand that the structure matters to making the next behavior change and even making this behavior change. And sometimes it's important to do a little more now so that we can continue making the kind of changes that we want to make. I'm going to, as I said, I had to skip some topics. Oh, this is so frustrating. Here's an experiment to try, and then I'll get to my, I'll conclude. The experiment to try is to carefully separate behavior changes and structure changes. Um, like put them in different PRs. Oftentimes, you're programming away. You say, oh, and I need to rename this. Oh, and I need to add an if statement here. Oh, and I need to extract a helper. Don't do that. Go back. And either do, the, do those in one order or the other where you make the structural changes, the name changes, introducing new sub-elements, uh, make those changes. That's one PR, finished, done. Shouldn't change the behavior of the system at all. And then make the behavior change. Or do the hacky behavior change first. And then do a second PR to do the cleanup to make those structural changes. The reason, I think, underlying reason for separating behavior changes and structure changes like this is that behavior changes in general are irreversible. That is, if we, Augusto, if we send out a wrong tax form, we can't take it back. So you have to be very careful about irreversible decisions. But you don't have to be so careful about reversible decisions and all structure changes are reversible. If we extract out a helper, we can just inline it. Right? That's, that's not a big deal. You don't need to apply the same level of rigor to reversible changes as you do to irreversible changes. By separating structure and behavior changes, give yourself a chance to apply different standards to what are 
very different sets of decisions. The structure changes, you can undo easily. The behavior changes, not so much. So there's an experiment to try when you go back. Now here's the message that I thought I was going to come with to you. And this is a big surprise to me. Uh, something that sparked my interest in uh, what I call the 3x model, explore, expand, extract, that I came up with to describe uh, how innovation happened at Facebook. Um, and uh, it is the resurgence of waterfall-style development. Yeah, exactly. How stupid is that? Well, it's not actually stupid, stupid. Smart people trying to solve real problems in a way that just doesn't work. And we know it doesn't work, but that doesn't stop them. Now, we could have an interesting discussion about the psychological motivations for doing waterfall development when you know it's not going to work. But the fact is, if you go out there in the wild, you see people saying stuff that's very waterfally. Now, I want, uh, at one point said, there are no big changes, there are only big feedback loops. And I believe that applies to waterfall. When you've specified one thing, it's just so tempting to go and specify the next thing without getting feedback on those first set of decisions. It doesn't work because one, we can't predict, and two, the very act of making a change in the world causes the world to change, which makes the next thing different. So the waterfall doesn't work, it never did, it still doesn't, it, you know, this time is different, it's not different. And yet, there are people saying very waterfally things and we'd at least introduced shame to the equation 20 years ago, where people would go, well, I have this big speck. <laughs> and they'd feel bad about it. Now, now, no, it's like, I have a big speck. What, what do you have? Oh, a bunch of test cases. <laughs> Somehow, the idea that feedback loops just simply have to be long has come back into fashion. So this is one of the advantages of being an old person, is I get to look at these things come back around, and you're like, oh, yeah, I know how this one ends. <laughs> Might take five years for all y'all to figure out how this one ends, but at least I don't have to worry about it, because I know how, where it's going. The DDD community is perfectly placed to counteract that tendency by insisting on feedback. You're the people who analyze more carefully and more thoroughly than other folks do. But when that moment comes when you've made some decisions and you know that they're at risk, you're also the people who are perfectly positioned to say, time out. I'm not sure about what we've done already I'm not comfortable adding more layers and more layers on top of this. Let's implement something. Let's put it in front of people. Let's see how they act. Let's see how that changes the context. Let's see what we learn from that feedback loop before we start making another set of decisions based on these risky assumptions. This room and your compatriots are perfectly positioned to, to tee that up and say, nope, we're not going to continue. However good it feels, however much progress we feel like we're making, however many insights we gain into the domain by thinking really hard about it, that's a thing. We need to do that, but we need to spread that over time. And here's how we're going to do that. Now, I'm not quite sure how your community spreads your techniques over time in that way. So I'm going to leave that as an exercise to the listeners. But what I can say is, in addressing our collective moment of insanity, going back to very, very long feedback cycles, you have an opportunity, a unique opportunity, to address that sooner and quicker 
than the people like me who are talking to mostly to folks who are writing code and writing tests and think that they shouldn't write tests because they don't have, know how to design software. And it's a long story. But that's what I, would, that's what I wanted to come to you to say. Is the waterfall's back, it's stopped apologizing, and it needs to be killed with fire. Thank you very much. <laughs>